My guest today is Hoop Somwa. Hoop, how are you? I'm doing good. Good. I'm, uh, uh, what, what do you do? I'm a software lead on the Halo services team. Cool. So we make the backend services for Halo. That sounds like a fun job. It's pretty fun. What's the most challenging part of that job? Um, trying to build services that are uh, cost-effective and can scale to meet the needs of the Halo fan base. And you're talking about services here. I, I don't usually think of services when I think of a console-based game. <laughs> that, that's, that is, is that kind of a new thing? Um, it's, services aren't necessarily a new thing, but there's a trend towards more and more things happening in the cloud or in services for gaming. Okay. Now, excuse me if I ask some simple questions. My kids are big gamers. Mm -hmm. We have an Xbox. They're big Halo players, actually. Yeah. But I'm not, so <laughs> I know what it That's is. Right. Yeah. Uh, so wh where, where do services come into play when we're talking about uh, a game like Halo? Well, one interesting place is when you're playing the game and you get online, you want to find, figure out which of your friends are online. Or okay. If anyone who you've played with recently is online, you can go online and it will tell you that, and then you can hop into a game with those people. All right. Um, another really popular thing is with Halo Waypoint. People can go online and see all the past games they've played. They can look at their game statistics. You can look at your battle proficiency, how good you are with a particular weapon, which weapons you're good at, which weapons you're not good at using. We okay. keep all, all this data stored in back-end services that can then power the Halo Waypoint experience on the console and in the web. Okay, so that, uh, that was challenging enough when there were just a few people playing Halo, yeah. but now Halo's exploded in popularity over the last yeah. four years, whatever it's been. And now it's a huge challenge, or yeah, it's a bigger actually, challenge. The game actually had its 10-year anniversary last year, Okay. Um, since the first Halo. And the first Halo didn't have any online component. You could plug Xboxes in together and do the system-like thing. Uh -huh. But now more and more people want to be able to play with people all over the world. Right. I play a lot with my brother in Atlanta, hmm. and uh, my cousin, uh, who's also in Atlanta, and my best friend down in California. So we all get online. And you're here in Redmond. Yeah, in Washington. I live here in Washington. Um, and so we all get online together and play. And that's something that started in Halo 2, and it's just become a really popular thing. Most games do that today. Are these uh, Azure-based services that you're talking about? The services that we build are all Azure-based on the Halo team now. Yeah. Okay. We, we transition to fully building our services in Azure as of Halo 4. So, so what are the challenges that you face building services like this that scale to, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people? Uh, well, making sure that the, the service can scale to that number of people based on how many times each individual person who's online is sitting the service is always a challenging thing. Making sure that the service is always available because there are some things that if they're not available, people can't play the game. That's inconvenient. So figuring out how to make the services much more reliable um, is a very interesting challenge. And then figuring out when you're building things to scale, how to scale out across hundreds of machines in, in the cloud environment is something that um, it involves a little bit more thinking because you want to be able to scale out instead of scaling up to one very big machine. Right. Uh, so can you describe the high-level architecture of what you're using to scale the service? Um, so we've, we've uh, greatly embraced Actor model, the Actor model of uh, service programming. Okay, describe that for me. So the idea is, if you think about any application in the cloud, you can logically group it into small micro-components, and we call these actors or brains. Um, and these actors can run independently, almost like little microservices running in the cloud. And these actors can communicate with one another. Um, let's say you have an actor that represents a player or an actor that represents a game. These guys can communicate with one another. And if you can build some sort of underlying system that, that allows you to abstract their existence and their positioning from the underlying hardware, okay. and it allows programmers to just build at the actor and at the logical level and not worry about things like how many VMs do I have, how many VMs do I have tomorrow, um, and instead think about what actors they're programming against and how the actors communicate. And then you can basically what you build a layer of abstraction underneath that that handles the other stuff. Can you give me an example of an actor? Um, so one actor would be an actor that represents an online player, for example. And then anytime something interesting changes with that player, like what map they're on, you might update the actor. So okay. the, the actor represents the player in the cloud. And then other players who are that player's friend can go and find out what map they're on by querying that actor. Okay, so you've uh, defined just a... A relatively simple interface for the actor, yeah. and this is just encapsulation that uh, prevents the from Yeah, I mean, I mean the, 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 the yeah, a very core idea there is simply saying that instead of having a player's service, I'm going to have a player actor, and I'm just going to distribute them across my data center. Mm -hmm. and, and if I have a system that can let me do that, I don't have to figure out how to build this giant service that sits across multiple servers. Instead, I'm building my player actors. And again, uh, there, there's a distinction there that we believe um, in, which is separating the underlying uh, player, uh, separating the underlying infrastructure from the individual application brains or actors that you're building, actually allowing people to develop in these different layers. 
Okay. If that explains it. That does. That's very good. Uh, tell me about the stateful information that you're capturing because there's uh, there's information that has to be remembered throughout the game. There's also information that's remembered tomorrow about exactly. what happened today. How, yeah. how do you handle that? So, must be a lot of data. Uh, Halo has a history of storing a lot of information um, about users, about statistics, and a lot of the Halo fans really love this about it. Mm -hmm. and so we have a massive back-end storage challenge that we need to address, which is storing information about every game that's ever been played, every player that's ever played in the game, keeping track of your rank, keeping track of how you've configured your armor. So we have a, a scale-out infrastructure built on top of Azure Storage that we use to store all of this information. We use we shard a bunch of information across Azure tables, as well as storing it in uh, uh, some information in Azure Blob Store as well. Mm, okay, so not using SQL at all. We are not using SQL um, as our primary store for anything in the Halo services. Okay, what else you done? Um, so. One of the interesting challenges we had was making sure our services scaled to lots of users with very little downtime from the user's perspective right. um, while being able to continuously update our services. We believe in continuously improving the services, making them better. And so one of the things that we use to be able to achieve this in Azure is Azure Service Bus. Hmm. Um, what we do is a lot of large messages that take a long time to process that can be processed asynchronously while the user is away, we can effectively put into an Azure Service Bus queue and then we have code that could take it off the service bus queue immediately, but it might not. It could sit mm. in the queue for a little bit, okay. and, and it could get processed at a later point in time. Also, if the server processing the key, this message dies, service bus queues will rebring the message back up at a later point and gets gets processed again. What's um, this is a point of confusion among a lot of Azure developers. What's the difference between the service bus queue versus the storage queues? And why do you choose service bus in that particular case? So in the, our particular case, we wanted to make use of the session feature of service bus queue because sometimes we want to process two different messages at the same time. And so we make sure we put them into a service bus queue with a session identifier that allows them to be pulled by the same person who's processing them. Okay. That's one of the differences between um, service bus queues and the Azure queues. The um, online MSDN actually has a very good comparison of the different features between them. Things like message size, uh, message kind, format, mm. the message, and the maximum size of the queue, things like that. There's there's a lot of interesting trade-offs that you, that you can use to choose between the two different queues. They actually pair well as, um, they're very different, although they're both queues. Okay. Do you, uh, How many people are using this uh, your, your service that you're writing? Uh, I can't speak to the actual number of users, but anyone who is playing Halo 4 is using our services. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just say a lot. <laughs> That's a big data. Do you do anything with the data afterwards? Uh, while you accumulate all this data, you're keeping it long term? So we're storing the data long term in Azure Storage because Halo, again, has a history of people being able to see their games when their games are online. Um, we also do a lot of business analysis and analytics on the data about okay. which games were played, which maps people played on, mm. to be able to understand how people are playing the game and make the game better over time. Okay. So we're using we're actually using Hadoop and Azure to do that. Interesting. It sounds like um, you're using a lot of cutting edge technology this in in, uh, in Windows Azure, and I think it's you're probably driving a lot of Azure development because of the feedback you're giving back to the Azure team. Yeah, Is we, that give, a fair we, statement? we try and provide as much feedback as we can to the Azure team. Uh, what's um, uh, what, what's next in uh, in your services and in the game industry in general? So I can't speak to my services or tell people what the game industry is going to do, but in general, one of the interesting trends that you're seeing in the industry today is a lot of people are um, leveraging functional programming and reactive programming uh, in services because it, um, it allows them to build very scalable services really easily. Okay, I know what functional programming. What is reactive programming? So reactive programming, um, one uh, one good resource for it is there's uh, reactive extensions for .NET. Okay. If you take the idea of um, SQL or querying a database and you turn that on its head, I think Eric Meyer refers to it as the mathematical dual of relational queries. Okay. Instead of having a data store that you're querying, instead you have a bunch of queries and as things are happening, they're hitting these queries and things might happen as a result of your queries being there or mm -hmm. they might not. So one example is um, in uh, we don't do this, this isn't the way it works today, but you can imagine of thinking of in Halo, if you get a certain number of kills, they regard that as a killing spree. Okay. So if I have a number of kill events that happen, I could have a reactive query that said, if I get five kills with no deaths, that's a killing spree event. And then it, it generates a killing spree as a result of that. And okay. It's, it's the exact same thing that, that you would do today um, from a, the way it looks to the user perspective, but reactive is coding it in a different way. 
Okay. You, know, you think of a lot of things that you do today, like this example I just gave, where you would turn the code on its head, and instead of having your code writing imperative code to do it, if you have a reactive programming system, you can actually write your you can write your code that um, in a way that's much more like what you meant, hmm. instead of actually having to implement it imperatively through code. Okay. So reactive programming is one of the ways people do this. Netflix actually just talked about how they've redone a lot of their front end using a reactive framework for Java that they built. Okay. And I think uh, that there's going to be a lot more people who are looking very closely at reactive programming. Today, a lot of people use reactive programming for UI. Mm -hmm. I think it has an interesting role to play in services as well. So I think we're going to see some more of that in the future. Okay. That was an aside I interviewed you. <laughs> we were talking about uh, a trend in the industry. Yeah. Um, so there's, I think, functional Around programming. Yeah. Functional programming is an interesting one. It's coming up a lot. There's a lot of companies where um, learning functional programming is now a thing that happens right when you join the company. Um, uh, reactive programming is another trend that I, I think is really, really interesting. I think that we're going to see a lot more of a nice pairing between real-time stuff and more delayed things like MapReduce. A lot of people are now starting to strike the balance between one or the other. All right. I think that's good. Okay. Thanks so much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Technology helps good friends become even better friends.